without further ado, my good friend, a real conservative, the Honorable Tom Delay. And uh, I, uh, uh, it, it, 
Fort Bend County has a wonderful Texas history, like I know Dallas and Karen County do too, but we had a, a Fort Bend County is where the original 300 colonists came uh, to Texas, Stephen F. Austin, and, and so we kind of claim a little bit more his Texas history than most. And in um, and, and Fort Bend County, after the, the war of Northern Aggression, the, the, uh, the, the Democrat Party split into two parties, the Woodpeckers and the Jaybirds, only in Fort Bend County. The yeah, Woodpeckers were black sympathizers, the, the Jaybirds were to keep, uh, during Reconstruction, blacks from holding office. Um, and I don't understand why the blacks uh, uh, vote 90% Democrat, when it was the Democrats that wanted to keep them in slavery, it was the Democrats that were against the, and, and the uh, Civil Rights Movement. It was the Democrats during Reconstruction that would, and that uh, tried to keep them down. But uh, these Jaybirds and these Woodpeckers had gunfights in Fort Bend County in front of we, uh, in front of our county courthouse. We got statues every time they had a damn gunfight. They put up a statue. <laughs> So, I mean, that was pretty tough politics, don't you know? And, and when I ran in 1978, the Fort Bend County Jaybirds were still around. And, and I was running as a Republican uh, And they shot Republicans in Fort Bend County. Uh, I, and so I ran in 1978. I was, I was too stupid to know, first of all, the history of Fort Bend County, and too stupid to know that I couldn't win. They never elected a Republican in Fort Bend County. But here I go, and I went, Thank God for the Republican women. I had the Republican women put women's club in Fort Bend County. There's only one. There's only 85 members. And, uh, and they adopted me. And they were my volunteer force. And they were the ones that got me elected in 1978. Uh, I'll never forget, I was walking one day, I told this story before, you may have heard it, but uh, right after the primary, in Fort Bend County, if you won the Democrat primary, the election was over. You were elected. And, but three weeks after the primary, I'm standing out in front of, in July, I'm standing uh, in front of Howard's Cafeteria at lunch, anytime you're around Rosenberg, Texas, so Howard's Cafeteria has a great cooking, all you can eat. Uh, lunch. And that's where all the businessmen and the rice farmers uh, ate lunch. So it's a good place to politic. And I stand out in front of Howard's Cafeteria shaking hands to people. I learned real quick, you don't shake hands until the end. They're hungry and mean. You always wait until they come back out. <laughs> so I'm, this one day, this huge rice farmer came walking, a Czech rice farmer. A lot of Czechs in Fort Bend County. We even had a Czech language radio station. Um, this check, I knew this check because he was wearing the telltale those square crown check cowboy hat. I knew he was a rice farmer because he wore the rice, Fort Bend County rice farmer's uniform. Brown boots, brown khaki pants, brown khaki shirt. Uh, he was at least 100, uh, 220 pounds, all muscle, 600, six foot six. And I walk up to him and say, hi, I'm Tom DeLay, I'm running for state representative. I'd like to talk to you about your vote. He looked down at me kind of funny. He said, what that election about three weeks ago? And there it was, he said, it? I said, no, 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 that was the primary. I'm the Republican in the race, and I'm running for the general election. Well, that did take him aback. And, and he just stood there and looked at me like I'd lost my mind. And he looked me up and down, but I waited him out. And finally he said, well, I'm going to tell you something. It'd be a cold day in hell before the Republican wins in this county. God is my witness. Election Day, 1978, was one of the coldest days on earth. <laughs> I am so proud of what it is. So many Democrats switch parties because their party left them. Yeah. I mean, the leftist party, progressive, whatever you want to call them, just, you know, they, they were just too much for so many, for Texans and, and here at the party. And how many Republicans we got now? Uh, 90 yeah. and 52. 26 out of 31. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. 26 Republican congressmen. Uh, uh, my whole, my whole problem, my whole problem is, is 98. Yeah. Uh, how many real Republicans? <laughs>
double jeopardy. Whatever happened to, to but no, until the last day of the statute of limitations, Ronnie Earl went to a grand jury that had just been sworn in, hadn't even been for orientation, 30 minutes, and got them to indict me on the last day. Then I was convicted, and it was a law that didn't even exist. I was, I was indicted on a law that doesn't exist in Texas. And then I, five years later, I was convicted and sentenced to three years in prison uh, for, the, for that. Thank goodness for the Republican city, and I'm not saying partisan, but on the Court of Criminal Appeals in Texas. Most people don't even know we have two Supreme Courts in, in, in Texas. We have the Crime Court, Court of Criminal Appeals, and we have the Civil Court, the Texas Supreme Court. And why, I don't know, but uh, why we need two Supreme Courts, but we got two Supreme Courts. And the, court, uh, the, fifth, the third Court of Appeals exonerated me, and then the Court of Criminal Appeals uh, affirmed that last October. And, but this whole ordeal is 18 years, $12 million. Wow. But that's what they want to do. It's called the criminalization of politics. And I'm not whining, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a big boy, and I can play this game. But I got to tell you, the Republicans don't fight. And I don't want them to fight up there. I don't want them to find corrupt Democrats that haven't broken the law and take them through this. But you don't have to. Every Democrat's corrupt. <laughs> They don't believe in the Constitution. They don't believe in rules. They believe in defining their own truth. They, they, you know, so yeah, they're out breaking the law all the time. And, and, and I, can, I, can, I can name you, I won't hear do it here, but I can name you member after member that is corrupt as you can imagine in the United States House of Representatives and half of the Democrats in the Senate that are as corrupt as you can believe. But the Republicans won't do anything about it. They do nothing. And it greatly upsets me that the Republicans uh, just won't fight. When are they going to fight? When, when, when is the leadership going to fight? Where is the leadership in the fight? Listen, I praise the Lord for every minute of everything that I went through because it was the Lord that got me through all of this. Uh, and the things that I learned, From him, and that you know, I really live the, the fact that he says that he will not never forsake me. I can tell you to this day, if you stay close to him, he will never forsake you. And he will walk with you. The things that I have to develop in myself come from him. The, the waiting on him, the, the fact that I don't worry about tomorrow. I just walk with him today. Amen. Uh, all of these things, he was he's molding me, shaping me. Uh, it, it, even to the extent that I became very good at praying for my enemies. You know, we're admonished to pray for our enemies. I guarantee you, if you want to deal with anger, then forgive and pray for your enemies. Because I would walk, I would walk into that courtroom in Texas and everyone would have hated me, and especially the judge, who, by the way, state reps. Uh, did you know that we have elected judges that get to serve for life? When you, the, I didn't know this until I was in there. You, you know, there's this controversy whether to elect judges or, or appoint them for life. We've got that in Texas. They run for office, but once you're a judge, you're a visiting judge for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And my judge was appointed, or to my case, who was a recluse nut <laughs> out of, out of uh, uh, San Antonio, Texas, that served one term as a district judge, one term. 25 years ago, and he ran in the Democrat primary for another for a higher elevation of Court of Appeals and lost the Democrat primary. And he's been living off of being the visiting judge ever since. That's the way it is in Texas. It's ridiculous. Either we're going to elect them or we're going to but let's don't elect them to be appointed for life. It's got to change. But my point, my point, ladies and gentlemen, is is that I walk into the courtroom and I'm looking in the eye, he even said during my trial, all you lawyers, 
in the middle of the trial in front of the jury that I was being guilty. <laughs> and, and I walk in and I said, good morning, judge. Isn't this a beautiful morning? I prayed for you this morning. And it just drives me nuts. <laughs> My mugshot. Somebody was making a joke a while ago about a mugshot. And he took a mugshot upstairs. But I'm going through it, the humiliation of being booked. I don't know how many of you have ever been booked, but it's a humiliating experience. They, and they intentionally do it that way to, to, to humiliate you. Uh, and, and so I'm going through the plain jail doors, and everybody in orange suits, you know, and, and they're dragging me through and put fingerprinting and all this kind of stuff. And it's time for the picture. And it was really interesting because as we were getting ready for the picture, they were telling me that about this great camera that I had gotten money to afford them to buy. <laughs> and they were going to take it by picture. But my prayer was, let them see Jesus through me. Amen. And I don't know if you've seen my mic shot, but my, my eyes are glowing and I'm smiling and I'm grinning. And the best part of that part was is outside the jail, the press was waiting for this mugshot. And the, the leftists were all out there too because they bought all these t-shirts and mugs and stuff to put my mugshot and raise money off of it. And when they saw it, they couldn't use it. <laughs> because I was walking with Jesus. And, and people, people, people just understood that kind of, uh, people that understand what I'm talking about, you understand what, I'm, uh, what, I, what I went through and how I was able to handle it. And I thank Jesus every day uh, for going through it because I'm such a better man today than I was. But it also gave me a, a vision into the future. Because I came to Christ when I came to Congress. It's really interesting. They're talking about me in the state legislature. What I was in the state legislature, I was the most arrogant, self-centered jerk as you could imagine. I thought I was really somebody. I, I went from pest control, killing bugs, and crawling under houses to a state representative. I thought I was really somebody. Well, I got to tell you, um, I got into all of it, the drinking, the partying, and all the stuff that goes on in Austin, Texas. If you're not careful, you get involved in all that kind of stuff. And I was, I was, a, I was a holy mess. I drank eight to ten to twelve martinis every night, uh, and and drove back to my apartment. But when I came to Congress, within three weeks, there was a member of Congress by the name of Frank Wolf who had this little ministry, and he would, he was very concerned about the breakup of the family in Congress, the divorce rate in Congress. Was higher than anybody and the breakup of the families and all the carousing and the stuff that goes on there and and he reaches out to freshmen so he comes knocking on my door one day and it's three weeks in, after I've been sworn in and I can turn down a senior member and come to see you uh, and he all he wanted to do was to show me a little video by James Dawson called, called where's dad and everything bad about Daddy that James Dobson talks about was that he was talking about me. Mm -hmm. And I just broke down. And then he invited me to come to a Bible study that meets every Wednesday at 1 o'clock in Washington. Or Thursday, actually. Thursday at 1 o'clock in Washington. I started going to that Bible study. And in five months, I came to Christ. And I've been walking with him ever since. That was in 1985. And I learned, and he brought people in touch with me, and I worked, and I grew stronger, and he worked on me, and he worked on me, preparing me for what I was going about to go through. And he, and he really prepared me. I'll never forget it. Uh, and, I, and I ran into people like Dr. Bill Bright, who wrote a book called Red Sky in the, morning, in the Morning, and just set me on fire. Because he was calling for a third awakening and he was begging God for a third awakening. You know, the first awakening, which is a spiritual revival before the, the independence uh, of the revolution, the second awakening before the, the uh, uh, Civil War, and 
Good. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, we desperately need a third awakening in this country. When Dr. Bill Bright fasted 40 days every year for nine straight years and, and gathered people around him, begging for a, a third awakening in this country and, and, and defining the reason God created this country. The, he didn't create this country for your comfort. He created this country for his purpose and to, so that capitalism and the Constitution and everything created this wonderful, wonderful country of ours. Why? So that the gospel, so that we would be affluent enough to spread the gospel all over the world. Then I ran into Chuck Colson, who wrote a book called How Now Shall We Live? It's all about worldview and if, what you believe and if you understand what you believe, then stand up and fight for what you believe in. And uh, I taught it at my church several times and I, and I tried to expand it all over the country, getting people to to uh, work and, uh, and, and with, this, with this book. Uh, and then one thing led to another. But the point I'm trying to make is, during this whole time as he's building me, uh, I, it, it became quite evident that my mantra was going to be Second Chronicles 7.14. When my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven. I will, I, I, I will forgive them of their sins and heal their land. That became my motto. Yeah. And that, that's what I worked for for the rest of my career was that. And through all of this, he was preparing me for where we are today, yep. ladies and gentlemen, as a nation. First and foremost, let me say, I have been working very hard in my entire career for spiritual revival. Not that I wore it on my sleeve or people knew I was doing it, but I organized it, all kinds of things. Don't have time to tell you about them. But the spiritual revival was coming. It's almost here. I can't, I can't name it as a third awakening. But I've been working with churches and pastors for the last five years while I've been going through this mess. And they have risen all over this country. Christians are coming forward all over this country. The spiritual revival is moving. The Holy Spirit is moving through God's people. I have never witnessed it before. And if you don't believe me, you know, remember the last election? We won the Senate by electing, by defeating nine incumbent Democrats, yeah. which is unheard of. Do you realize that each one of those nine Republican senators that were elected enjoyed, each one of them enjoyed 52% of the vote they got was evangelical Christian. Wow. It may not be the third day awakening. We won't know until we look back to history to see if it's actually moving. But I can feel it. I can feel it moving around this country. It's, it is absolutely amazing. People waking up to the Constitution. Ladies and gentlemen, we are at a point in time. Thank you, Lord, for Barack Obama. Because, you know, for a for hundred years, the left, progressives, whatever you want to talk about, have been able to hide their worldview from you with the help of the media. They lie every day about what they truly believe in. And one of the bedrocks that they believe in is shredding the Constitution. The other bedrock that they believe in is they've got to get God out of the public square or they cannot maintain the power that they want. To, and so they have systematically worked for a hundred years getting God out of the public square and using anything and everything, especially the courts, to do that. Now, we have got, we have, we are at a point where people have seen, oh, Barack Obama just took the veil off. He just, here I am. I'm the most leftist person I am. He is a communist. He is a Marxist. His mother was a communist or a Marxist. His grandparents were communists and Marxists. His mother was a barmaid prostitute for Frank Marshall Davis, the most incredible Marxist that walked in the United States of America. 
Um, in fact, some people are saying that's... <laughs> the, but the point is, is, you are seeing, the American people are seeing what communism, Marxism, socialism, whatever you want to call it, is really all about. And you're seeing it. You've seen it for six, six years. And the most important part about it is, is that he is so violating the Constitution of the United States. There's a thing on the weather, they're getting flashes that everyone needs to go down to the basement. They have the tornadoes, in fact, they've closed. Tornadoes? The, is that what they're saying, the light park, they're getting down to the basement? Right now, there's a large storm that's been packing high winds. What S1 said it was 66 miles an hour or more. At the ballpark, they've already moved people to the basement. So if everybody wants to calmly make your way downstairs so that we can get the low ground, that would be great. Okay.
unbelievable. It's hard to describe. I have meetings every 10 to 15 minutes, sometimes two to three meetings every 10 to 15 minutes. I run from room to room to room to room. I mean, I, I was a, a pretty busy guy for 12 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. So I wake up in the morning and my mind would race through what that schedule was that I'm going through. But this particular morning, I wake up and my mind is racing. But it was just absolutely amazing. My mind was going through a list of all the prayers that I had prayed and the answers to each one of those prayers. I laid there for almost an hour going through that list. You had to pull me off the ceiling. I was so full of joy to know that the Lord loves me so much and loves me and, and, and that He brings, constantly bring me bring that peace and that joy. So, as I get to where we are now and how we have seen, we are at a point, especially in the election of 2016, where the American people are getting a very clear choice on the future of this country. And I've already talked about we have got to get God back in the public square. And I won't spend a lot of time on that, but ladies and gentlemen, our system of government was created by God. Now I get trashed by the media by saying that. Do you mean God wrote the Constitution of the United States? Yes, he did. Through his people. He uses his people for all the time. It's very well known. And this whole notion that that the, the founding fathers were a bunch of deists and all that, no, they weren't. They were strong believers. Uh, Samuel Adams, who was actually called the father of the Constitution, and a prolific writer, talking all the time, he never used the word liberty without using the word religion and morality along with it. And he said that we cannot survive as a nation unless we are first and foremost standing firmly on, on, uh, with God and understanding that God is, is part of all this. The Declaration, you cannot talk about the Constitution without talking about the Declaration of Independence that talks about God. And we get our rights from God. And the Constitution comes from God. And it also says in the Declaration of Independence, the consent of the governed. Yeah. And that came straight from God. That, and it was manifested in the Constitution. So, ladies and gentlemen, if we take God out of our public square, this is what we get. Amen. We are deserving everything that we are getting Amen. right now because we have allowed them to kick God out of the public square. So what I'm calling you on is for you to put him back in. Yes. I don't care if you're a school board member or president of the United States. Every step of the way, we have to bring God back into it. And I'm just very quickly challenge the school board members that are here. Or if they're not here, then you, as a Republican club, demand that they put the Bible back into the school. Woo! Yes! Yes! Those are the kinds of fights that we need, ladies and gentlemen, because we cannot have the system of government that we have today unless we have good people running the system. Yes. Well, who was it, James Madison, in, in the Federalist Papers, was talking about if men were angels, we wouldn't need a government. Amen. If, if, if angels governed men, then we wouldn't need internal or external uh, 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 pressures on the, the uh, uh, government or in the government because our government is designed for a good people. You cannot have a good people that don't believe in God. That's where we get it from. Our values, our character, what we believe in, everything about us. What we believe is what we do. And what we do is run a government without God. How do you do that? You don't. And so every day, in fact, I'll just tell you. I was talking earlier with Bill about this. Just this week, the Republicans in the Senate are very proud of the fact that they're going to hold Obama on this Iran deal. They passed a bill out of unanimously with people like Barbara Boxer voting for it. Makes you wonder. They passed it out unanimously, completely rewriting the Constitution when it comes.
comes to ratifying a, a treaty. They completely rewrote the Constitution. It's very difficult for you to understand, but let me try to explain it to, to you. If a president is negotiating a foreign with a foreign entity, whatever agreement that they make is a treaty. Yes. I don't care if Obama no. calls it an executive order, but it is a treaty and it does not have the force of law unless, by the Constitution, two thirds of the Senate votes in the affirmative uh, for the treaty. Well, you know what they did in the committee yes, last week? They switched it. And now 60, it only takes 60 people to vote in the negative. They get the treaty, they look at it in the Senate, and then if they are against it, then they vote against it. They don't vote for it. And they get 60 votes, all they need is 60 votes to vote against it. Well, what does that do? That puts nine Democrats in charge. If they bring it to the floor, all it takes is the Democrats to say no to the vote, and they don't even get to vote on it. And they're proud of that. And then, if they do vote on it, let's say, they find these Democrats, and they vote on it, and they say no to the treaty, guess who gets to veto it? Obama gets to veto it. Because it has to, also has to pass the House. That's not what the Constitution says. It says the Senate, the advice and the consent of the Senate voting in the affirmative, two-thirds of the Senate voting. The Republicans are doing this to the American people. And we're allowing them to do it. Because we're not outraged by what they're doing. The leadership in the House and the Senate are, I mean, that's why I am calling for it, ladies and gentlemen. We have to not only have spiritual revival and bring God back into the, to the uh, uh, public square, we have to have a revolution for the Constitution and it starts right now.
we have to impose the Constitution. I'm trying to raise this when I was in the Congress and not majority leader. The last year I was majority leader, I passed five bills limiting the jurisdiction of the courts. Did you know you could do that? Did you know that in the Constitution it says that the Congress can tell the courts what cases they can and cannot hear? I passed five bills out of the House that did things like you can't hear a case on the Ten Commandments in the courthouse. You can't hear a case about fresh on the um, uh, very Christmas in the courthouse square. You can't hear a case on burning the flag. You can't hear it. Ladies and gentlemen, they drove the court nuts. <laughs> my, if I had stayed in Congress, my ultimate goal was start impeaching judges for yeah. 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 Because whenever a judge at any level legislates from the bench or violates the Constitution, the Congress, especially the House, has every right to drag their rear ends before the Judiciary Committee and yeah.
we should be talking about the economy. You want to talk about the economy? Okay, let's talk about the economy. We have to demand of every presidential candidate that they be bold for the Constitution and, and do things that are constitutional and veto things that are unconstitutional. And you can start by eliminating departments that are unconstitutional, like the Department of Education. Yeah.
and he studied the Constitution, so he was kids were getting a scholarship for the college and they act as an extracurricular thing. I thought that was incredible. The first thing out of this beautiful high school senior's mouth was, how many amendments are there to the Constitution? I don't know. We didn't raise our hands, but I didn't, I didn't know the answer. I was so embarrassed that I didn't know the answer that I took the course. We did it for six months. And I have taken, I'm not a constitutional expert, but I understand it. I've taken courses, I've taken all kinds of things. I'm just asking you, at least read it. And secondly, if you'd like to know a little bit more about it, go to Hillsdale College online and get a degree for Constitution 101. It doesn't take any time at all. And frankly, it's fun. Yeah, they have a new new one now. It's fun. It's fun to learn the history and why they did what they did and put this document together and why it is so important. And most importantly, how does it affect you in your daily life? That's what Ben Franklin said. Yeah. Lady, if you can hang on. We didn't hire you, she could have talked. Okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What, I, what I'm trying to tell you is that there is a If you don't know the answer, I'll give it to you. It's 27. 27 members to the Constitution. You know, since 1979, I have gone for all this time through, and I've met kings and presidents, members of Congress, senators, and all these people, and I always try to kind of edge up to them and through conversation, I ask them that question. How many members of the Constitution? You know less than 10% can answer the question. And that's who's representing them. That's who has sworn an oath of office to protect this document with everything other being, and yet every day they violate and strip it, and we don't demand differently. What you can do at all levels, from the school board to the President of the United States, when you get the opportunity, ask them how many amendments there are to the Constitution. And through that, you can open the conversation and get to them to ask them what does the, the Constitution mean to you? And how are you going to apply it in your next job? If you get it. I'm talking about city council. I'm talking about county commission. I'm talking about state legislators. I'm talking about federal people too. Because every one of them square note to the Constitution, even in school board, in most cases. And yet nobody holds them accountable when they violate it. And I've got, there's a lady running around here about great uh, cameras. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go get it. That's about as unconstitutional. Where did you get your character and morality from? And 
And do you know what that constitutes? How many amendments are there? And, do you, and how does that apply to the job you're about to dig into? If we can do that, then we will elect people, good people, that understand the Constitution and carry it out. And ladies and gentlemen, we will have turned this ship of state that we have created over the last hundred years in a completely different direction that will bring the most incredible, uh, wonderful, uh, affluent society Amen. Uh, this country ever, ever experienced. If we get rid of, of the bad guys and put in the good